Welcome. In this video, we're going to continue our look at European imperialism uh, with case study on Africa in the second wave of imperialism in the late 1800s. Last time, we looked particularly at the Congo, which was an example of selfish and selfless motives. Uh, for these next few, uh, the main contrast I'm going to provide is between our later study of Ethiopia and Japan, which were two countries that modernized and industrialized and were able to defend themselves against imperialism, and many other countries who uh, clung to their traditional way of life, and unfortunately for them, uh, other countries took advantage of that and punished them for it, and uh, they were victims of imperialism. The first we'll look at today is Tanzania or German East Africa, or Tanganyika. In 1905, it was discovered that a particular spring of water had magical properties, and that the Tanzanian soldiers could sprinkle themselves with this water and become invincible to the German bullets. And so they did so. They sprinkled themselves, they went into battle, and they were slaughtered against German machine guns. Uh, this, I point out as an example of, again, as we said, uh, adherence to their traditional belief was taken advantage of and exploited by others and uh, did not result in a successful adaptation of the modern world. In a slightly similar incidence in the Sudan uh, in 1885, there was an Islamic Mahdist rebellion where a, a messiah-like figure among the Muslims in the Sudan uh, believed that a savior, a messiah, had come to lead them to victory and independence from the British. Now the British very successfully practiced a divide and conquer campaign where they actually have some black Sudanese who fought with them, they have some Egyptians who fight with them, and they're able to uh, divide in the Sudan. You know, for example, today there's actually Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan is almost entirely black African, and Sudan is heavily uh, sort of uh, Arab African, North African. And uh, the, uh, the British were experts at exploiting this ethnic divide and uh, sort of lumping all of the Sudan into one country. And so, uh, again, they were able to successfully suppress this uh, Mahdist rebellion in Sudan. Uh, Egypt, rather than an example of uh, resistance, Egypt had been part of the Ottoman Empire for centuries and had been granted a limited independence from the Ottomans in the early 1800s. And it had begun to construct the Suez Canal. But as it got into debt, uh, the British took over. Uh, the Suez Canal would connect the Red Sea with the Mediterranean Sea. And in particular, for the perspective of the British, this would become controlled by them and known as the lifeline of the British Empire because it connected Europe with India in a fraction of the time. I believe it cut uh, over half of the travel time off between uh, Europe and India and much of Asia by being able to go by sea through the Mediterranean rather than all the way around uh, Africa when traveling between Europe and Asia. Several other examples of geopolitics similar to this. In geopolitics, the idea is you are controlling strategic areas of the globe for political or military reasons. So uh, it's not, you know, the British don't have uh, an ethnic claim to the Suez Canal. They don't have a historical claim there. They wanted to control it because of its strategic geographical location, that it was this canal that would connect the uh, uh, oceans of the world. Uh, other examples included the British efforts to build a Cairo to Cape Town railroad, a railroad that stretched the entire north to south uh, stretch of Africa going all the way through all British colonies. They were ultimately blocked partly by geography uh, and the difficult terrain and partly by that Tanzania, that one German colony in German East Africa that uh, sort of stood in their way uh, between that and the Belgian Congo, that the British otherwise controlled a strip of Africa all the way from uh, Cairo in Egypt at the north and Cape Town at, in South Africa. Another example is the Panama Canal, where the United States uh, tried to uh, negotiate control of a canal in, in Panama, which was then part of the country of Colombia. When Colombia would not agree to the U.S. terms, the United States uh, encouraged Panamanian rebels, who then gave the canal zone to uh, the United States in, in sort of thanksgiving for helping them gain independence from Colombia. 
We gave the example during industrialization on the, uh, the idea of coal stations, that countries wanted to control these coal stations all over the world so they could refuel their navies. The British from the, around this time, from the time of uh, the Napoleonic Wars, controlled the Strait of Gibraltar, which is this uh, fortress-like territory on the southern tip of Spain that controls access in and out of the Mediterranean Sea. So the British wanted to control that, for example, and built a major base and fortress there that I believe they hold to this day. Uh, the Strait of Malacca become, is similarly where the British control the uh, island territory of Singapore at the tip of the Malay Peninsula to control the Strait of Malacca in Asia. And then finally, the Turks, uh, the Ottoman Empire, controls the Bosporus Strait, giving access in and out of the Black Sea, which is relevant uh, to several countries, but none more so than Russia. And so Russia and uh, Turkey, or Russia and the Ottomans, will uh, struggle over control of the Bosporus Strait. So those are all great examples of geopolitics that become very prominent in this world, uh, largely as a result of the steam engine, due to railroads and especially steamboats uh, traveling all over the world becomes so much quicker, easier, and controlling these locations becomes all the more relevant and important to these militaries. And we already talked about the divide and conquer strategy. Our next example is uh, South Africa. In South Africa, uh, the British uh, were actually the, the second to colonize the Dutch had uh, colonized in South Africa hundreds of years earlier. And so there was a large uh, Dutch-speaking minority uh, of longtime South African people. And so there already was a heavy white minority in addition to the black majority in South Africa. But when the British took control of South Africa, now there are three factions. And so a much of this Boer War, uh, Boer is the Dutch word for farmer, and so a lot of these Dutch uh, these white South African uh, Dutch and their descendants um, fought against the British and resented the, the new British control. Eventually, the British are successful, but uh, they leave behind a legacy that lasts until, the, until roughly 1990 with the apartheid system, where they establish a system uh, that is every bit as discriminatory as the United States Jim Crow laws, but with the added indignity that uh, with Jim Crow laws in America, you often had a uh, 60, 80, 90 percent white majority that was oppressing a smaller black minority. You had the added indignity in South Africa of a 10 percent white minority that was oppressing a 90 percent black majority where uh, the police force and the military and judges and juries and, and you know, legal profession and teachers and officers, all types of uh, upper and middle class positions were held only by this small white minority in this apartheid system. And um, this would not end uh, for, for another hundred years. And finally, uh, sort of the non-example, the one that breaks the mold, is the example of Ethiopia. Ethiopia has a long and storied history. Um, a lot of people don't realize that... Um, there, there is actually a large minority. There is a, a reasonably sized minority group of black Jews historically in the world. And Ethiopia is one of the places that um, is a historic home of black Judaism. Uh, also, the, the people and kings of Ethiopia liked to uh, boast that they had the first uh, Christian kingdom in the history of the world. Even before the emperors of Rome became Christian, the king of Ethiopia had become a Christian. And so remember that one of those motives of imperialism was, um, uh, was religious. And so in many of these places, you had uh, native and animist religion, or you had Islam, and Ethiopia was a place where you had this long history of Judaism and Christianity, which you also had in Europe. And so you take away one of the motives that... Um, uh, many, many imperialists uh, said that they were sponsoring. You also had a forward-thinking and powerful king, Menelik II, who sort of saw the writing on the wall, wall and saw what was happening in other countries. And so he attempted to purchase modern weapons, attempted to modernize the economy in every way possible, and to industrialize where possible, but to especially model his army on the European-style armies. And then also using just shrewd negotiating tactics and trying to use the divide and conquer strategy against the Europeans by basically pitting one European group against the other where, you know, in other countries it was, say, the British 
who would play two African ethnic groups against each other. In Ethiopia, King Menelik managed to basically uh, sort of turn that around and say, well, France, you know, you you fear Britain is more than you fear us, so don't wouldn't you rather we stay neutral than we ally with the other one? And so he uses, in many ways, the he, he adopts the European strategies and tactics and is able to maintain uh, independence for Ethiopia. Until a late comer to the imperialist uh, conflict arrives, which was Italy. Italy uh, had these designs on greatness. Italy, the home of the Roman Empire, Italy, the home of the Renaissance, had not become a nation state and had not acquired colonies the way other more powerful neighbors, such as France, um, and eventually Germany, Britain, as they had. And so Italy uh, will eventually conquer Libya, but prior to this, they, they found one of the only few places to join the club of colonizing powers, one of the only places left that had not been conquered by a European country is Ethiopia. And so they demanded sort of privileges and rights in Ethiopia. King, uh, King Menelik refused. The Italians invaded. And at the Battle of Attawa in, in 1896, and it's on there twice, uh, in 1896, the Italians were defeated by the Ethiopian army, and they had to pull out. And similar to what one we'll talk about next time, the Jap uh, Russo-Japanese War, this sort of flies in the face of the prevalent racist theory, which was that imperialism and military success of the Europeans was justified and Darwinian and part of um, sort of social Darwinism, evolution. They were, they were do this. It was just uh, how the world should work. And this sort of flied in the face, and there's more evidence that, no, it's, it m refers more to the technology and industrialization of a country has more to do with its power and success than the ethnicity of the people living there. And so Ethiopia is the prime African example of that. Thanks for watching.